Welcome back to Conflicts of Interest. This is episode 268. I'm the host, Kyle Lansloan. Hope everybody had a great New Year's. Um, hopefully 2023 is less uh, world light than 2022. Although, as I expressed on the last show, I really don't have uh, you know much actual logical hope for that. Just more emotional. Come on. Uh, let's let's have some less war. So, anyways, I just want to remind people to share the show, Libertarian Institute, on the blog at antiwar.com, YouTube, Rumble, Odyssey for the video version of the show. Our sponsor is Paloma Verde, Paloma Verde CBD.com. The promo code is peace. You're working on a New Year's resolution. You want to, you know, get out and do quite a bit more. You know, you want to start exercising and things like that. Well, check out the sports cream they have at Paloma Verde. It's absolutely great for relieving muscle pain. So, you know, if uh, the thing that's going to set you back is the day after working out, you're not feeling so great, you're really tight, you're really sore, check out the sports cream from Paloma Verde. Uh, you will not be disappointed. PalomaVerdeCBD.com. The promo code is PEACE. That's going to save you 20% off and it'll get the show kit back. Now let's get into the episode. First story here I have from the Libertarian Institute that I wrote um, on December 29th with Connor Freeman. U.S. warplane reports unsafe encounter with Chinese jet. The U.S. Department of Defense released a video showing a Chinese fighter jet flying near an American RC-135 Revit Joint Reconnaissance plane. The Pentagon claims the incident occurred in the skies over the South China Sea, although there's no exact location on a map or anything uh, like that that the Pentagon provided. So, you know, this is all just the Pentagon claims. The Department of Defense released the video on Thursday but noted the unsafe encounter uh, took place more than a week ago. On December 21st, uh, China Standard Time, the People's Liberation Army Navy J-11 fighter pilot performed an unsafe maneuver during an intercept of a U.S. Air Force RC-135 aircraft, which was lawfully conducting routine joint operations over the South China Sea in international airspace, it said in a statement. Now, it's important to note here the U.S. and China have different ideas of what constitutes uh, Chinese and international territory, particularly over the South China Sea, uh, with China claiming much of the South China Sea as its own territory and the U.S. claiming that these are international waters. And so then our spy planes, et cetera, could be over there where if it's Chinese territory, then, you know, China would be right in saying that the American military plane shouldn't be in that territory. The Chinese pilot flew an unsafe maneuver by flying in front of and within 20 feet of the nose of the RC-135, forcing the R-35 to ev take evasive maneuvers to avoid a collision. And this was in the statement, that was the statement published by the Pentagon. Now, I watched the video. Uh, it's published on DVIDs. And from what I could see, and again, maybe this is me not understanding aviation enough. So if anybody else wants to watch the video and tell me that I'm wrong about these things, I don't see this plane approaching within 10, 10 to 20 feet of the RC-135. It's clearly further away than that. I Maybe 10 to 20 yards, but I, I would guess, you know, probably closer to like 30 yards, 40 yards or so, which... Again, you know, these very large planes traveling at a very high rate of speed, we've covered incidents in the past on the show where, you know, a, a very slight miscalculation by uh, a pilot of, I think, an F-18 led to a, a crash that, I, I think, killed 11 people. You know, this was an American training mission, but still, you know, the, this is not the the kind of maneuver that, that can't go wrong, right? So that that being said... Uh, in that video, I don't see this Chinese plane cross in front of the, the American plane, which is one of the big claims. And again, it, it doesn't look that close. Um, and another big issue here is whether, you know, the American plane should even be in the, this airspace, seeing how it's uh, pretty much, you know, the Chow China, Chow, South China Sea is almost literally the opposite side of the world. So uh, Indo-Pacific Command reported that the incident happened in international airspace over the S South China Sea, claiming it is dedicated to a free and open Indo-Pacific and will continue to fly, sail and operate at the sea in international airspace with due regard for the safety of all vessels and aircraft 
except under international law. It added that it expects all countries in the Indo-Pacific to use international airspace safely and in accordance with their national law. And so, look, they're saying that, well, we have this international law on our side. And so because of that, we could do what we want here. And in China, if you interfere, you're in violation of international law. So you're wrong, even if, you know, China inter- interprets this whole event differently. While Washington maintains the South China Sea as international territory, the Pentagon declined to specify the exact location of the close encounter. Beijing claims much of the region as its own sovereign waters, but has not responded to the American release of the video as a part of a massive military buildup in Beijing, launched by the Barack Obama administration and expanded by both of his successors. The U.S. has flown a myriad of sorties with reconnaissance aircraft throughout the South China Sea, East China Sea, and Yellow Sea in recent years. In 2021, Washington flew over 2,000 sorties in those waters amid other American military provocations, such as a sharp increase in deployments of aircraft carrier strike groups to the South China Sea and nearly monthly transits through the disputed Taiwan Strait by U.S. warships. With tensions between Washington and Beijing already soaring, under the Biden administration, the risk of an accident or crash leading to further escalation is significantly heightened. The next article I wrote for the Libertarian Institute on December 30th with Will Porter, China conducts military maneuvers near Guam, Okinawa. The Chinese aircraft carrier Lionese has sailed near the Japanese island of Okinawa and the U.S. territory of Guam over the past two weeks. The naval operations came at the end of a year which saw several military escalations between Washington and Beijing. Tokyo reported the aircraft carrier and at least four other large warships operating in the waters near Okinawa, adding the ships remained about 150 miles offshore for several days. While in the area, the Chinese carrier conducted over 200 takeoff and landing drills. On Thursday, Japanese officials confirmed that after sailing away from Japan, the flotilla traveled near the U.S. territory of Guam. According to the Global Times, a Chinese new paper closely linked to the country's ruling Communist Party, the operation showed the Chinese aircraft carrier is ready to defend against potential U.S. attacks launched from there. The relationship between Washington and Be- Beijing has continued to deteriorate in 2022, perhaps best exemplified by Nancy House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's trip to Taiwan last summer and the massive round of Chinese military drills launched near the island in retaliation. President Joe Biden has further fueled tensions by repeatedly asserting that the U.S. would come to China's defense in the event of a chi- uh, of Taiwan's defense in the event of a Chinese invasion. However, Taiwan is not recognized as a sovereign nation under U.S. law, which instead endorses Beijing's claim to the island and calls for a position of strategic ambiguity towards Taipei. While a number of past U.S. administrations have refrained from openly saying whether Washington would intervene against China on Taiwan's behalf, Biden has increasingly endorsed that position, prompting senior White House officials to walk back his statements on multiple occasions. Proponents of the strategic ambiguity contend that the policy acts as a deterrent against a future attack by Beijing and stops short of emboldening Taipei to take aggressive actions of its own. Beijing re- uh, Biden recently met with President Xi on the sidelines of the G20 summit while the goal was to seek to resolve outstanding issues between the two powers. Both countries continue to conduct provocative military exercise. Tokyo, which is part of a three-way security pact with Washington and Seoul created to confront Beijing, has also escalated regional tensions by announcing an end to its post-World War II defense oriented and plans to become the world's highest world's third highest weapons spender over the next five years. Moreover, the United States has worked to uh, persuade its allies in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization to take parts in operations in Chinese claimed waters, while Canada recently announced plans to conduct more military transits through the disputed Taiwan Strait. Beijing has significantly... uh, deepened its security and diplomatic ties with Moscow this year, with the two allies striking a no-limit strategic partnership in the days before Russia's invasion of Ukraine in late February. The Asian superpowers have conducted joint drills in the waters and skies around Japan and ta- uh, Taiwan in recent weeks. Having just wrapped up a round of naval exercises in the East China Sea on Tuesday, another round of war games on December 14th, uh, saw Chinese warships cross multiple Japanese straits as Russian fighters and bombers flew near Japanese airspace over the Sea of Japan. 
Underscoring the rising hostilities earlier this week, the Pentagon released a video uh, that I just discussed, the, the unsafe maneuver article. All right, so this article from Dave DeCamp at antiwar.com, State Department approves $180 million arms sale for Taiwan. The State Department on Wednesday approved a potential $180 million arms sale for Taiwan amid heightened tensions with China over U.S. support for the island. The Pentagon's Defense Security Cooperation Agency said the deal was for vehicle launch, volcano, anti-tank munitions, lane systems, and related equipment. The primary contractors for the deal are Northam Grumman and Oshkosh Corporation. The State Department approval notify Congress of the potential deal and begins a period which lawmakers could attempt to blot the sale, but the sale shouldn't have any issues as there is virtually no opposition to arming Taiwan in Congress. All right, now on to the real bad news, uh, the war in Ukraine, of course. No sign of peace in Ukraine as New Year approaches. This again from Dave DeCamp. After over 10 months of fighting between Russia and Ukrainian forces, there is no sign that 2023 will bring peace to Ukraine as the warring powers have radically different demands and the U.S. continues to escalate aid for Kiev and its role in the war. Ukrainian officials are demanding that Russia withdraw from all the territory it has captured and face war crimes tribunal before peace talks can begin. While Russian officials say they are open to talks but insist that any peace deal must involve the territories it annexed joining the Russian Federation. The only way Ukraine would likely be compelled to talk with Russia is if the U.S. leverages aid to push them to do so, as the Ukrainian war effort is entirely reliant on support from its Western backers. There was a glimmer of hope in November when Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley, said Winter provided a good opportunity for peace talks, but his view was not pop popular one w within the Biden administration. Milley said the warring side should seize the moment to achieve peace but following his comments, the U.S. reassured Ukraine that negotiations don't need to happen. Media reports said that other high-level officials, including Secretary of State Antony Blinken and National Security Advisor Jade Sullivan, were against the idea of talks. The only time a peace deal seemed possible during the war was after Russia and Ukrainian negotiators held in-person talks in Istanbul back in March, but reaching an agreement with Russia while was discouraged by the West and then British Prime Minister Boris Johnson visited Kiev in April and urged Zelensky not to negotiate with Mos Moscow, likely at the behest of the U.S. and NATO. According to Ukrainian media report, Johnson's visit was a major factor in scuttling negotiations. Turkey later said in April that some NATO members wanted the war in Ukraine to continue to make Russia weaker. A few days later, later Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin admitted that a U.S. goal in Ukraine was to weaken Russia. While discouraging negotiations throughout the 10 months of war, the Biden administration has continued to escalate military aid for Kiev, and so far, Congress has authorized $112 billion in spending to support Ukraine. The latest escalation, the administration will be providing Patriot missiles. The U.S. considers its most advanced air defense system, although Russia said it received insurances from the U.S. that no U.S. troops would be deployed to Ukraine uh, with the systems. The administration has held off from sending Ukraine the longer-range missiles, fighter jets, and advanced tanks that had seats, but Biden will be under pressure to oblige Ukraine from Republicans as they take control of the House. While there are some significant um, while there is some significant dissent among the GOP on the policy of arming Ukraine. Republican leadership has been critical uh, of Biden for not sending more advanced weapons. Representative Michael McCall, who is expected to take uh, the lead of the House Foreign Affairs Committee next year, has accused President Biden of slow walking military aid to Kiev. McCall said that the U.S. should provide Ukraine with more advanced weapons to hit targets in Crimea. McCall and other hawkish Republicans have come out in favor of more transparency for the tens of billions of dollars the U.S. is spending on the war, but the calls for more oversight have been used to justify the presence of U.S. troops inside Ukraine, as the Pentagon now acknowledges it has a small number of personnel in the country for on-site weapons inspections, which are based at the U.S. Embassy in Kiev. 
NBC News reported earlier this month that the Pentagon is mulling sending a small number of additional troops to track weapons, a plan a former U.S. official called a classic mission creep. The report said Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin wanted to add more troops for oversight and to ensure there are experts in the country to help Ukraine use critical weapons in them, signaling they may be doing more than just tracking weapons. The small group of U.S. military weapons in uh, military personnel inside Ukraine is the only presence that the U.S. has been officially confirmed. The Intercept reported in October that U.S. Special Operations Forces and CIA personnel are also inside the country, but the U.S. hasn't officially acknowledged the covert campaign. So that this is a really great article by Dave DeCamp. Uh, I do want to move on and talk about something that Dave notes in that article, and this is written by Will Porter at the Libertarian Institute. Russia receives U.S. assurances on Patriot missile deployment to Ukraine. American soldiers will not operate Patriot missile batteries slated to be shipped to Ukraine, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said, citing recent talks through diplomatic bad channels. Moscow previously threatened to destroy the advanced air defense system should they reach the battlefield. The FM detailed a rare discussion between U.S. and Russian officials during an interview on Wednesday, saying his country has received assurances that the Patriots sent to Kiev will not be accompanied by U.S. personnel. We ask Americans via the channels that our embassies still have whether the decision to send Patriot systems to Ukraine means that American specialists will be there as well, considering the complexity of the operation of these systems. We are told at length that this is not being planned specifically because of the Americans do not want to and will not fight against Russia directly. The Patriot systems will be deployed within the next several months as Ukrainian servicemen finalize themselves with this technology. So... This, I think, is good news for a couple of reasons. One, that these bad channels exist and are being used and are uh, effective it is extremely important, and this is some really good news. The, the other thing here is that, you, you know, if the Americans are continuing to tell the Russians that we don't want to fight you directly, that I think that's a good sign, too, even if... You know, both sides may be willing to fight each other and kill each other still, even if this is just publicly what they're saying. Earlier this month, back to Will's article, CNN was the first to report that Washington had nearly finalized plans to supply Patriot batteries, noting that Ukrainian troops would be trained on the systems at U.S. Army bases in Germany. Just days later, following the White House visit by Ukrainian President Zelensky, the Pentagon unveiled another $1.85 billion in lethal aid for Ukraine, including a lone Patriot battery made up of launchers, radars, and a control station and ammunition. The decision marked the 28th military package for Ukraine, drawn from U.S. stockpiles since the Russian invasion last February, bringing the direct military aid to Ukraine to just shy of $22 billion. That sum does not include the funds spent under a separate uh, Ukraine Security and Assistance Initiative, USAI, which in lets to procure arms for the weapons industry rather than existing American arsenals. Russian officials previously said that any Patriot missiles sent to Kiev would quickly become legitimate targets with President Vla uh, Vladimir Putin, claiming that the Patriot is a rather old system while vowing to find an antidote to their air defense problem platform. While the U.S. military initially assisted it would provide Patriots to Ukraine due to the lengthy training period and the large number of personnel needed to operate them, the Pentagon has apparently reversed course on this stance. It is unclear what changed uh, in the months since, and officials had not previously um, had not provided an exact time frame for when the systems will be ready to use by Ukrainian forces, only saying it will take several months. And we had previously discussed this on the show with an uh, article written by Kelly Blahos that was absolutely fantastic going over uh, how difficult these systems are to use and why, you know, sending one lone Patriot battery to Ukraine is likely not going to have any battlefield impact. Lavrov says Pentagon threatened decapitation strike against Putin. This is very concerning. Great article here by Dave DeCamp. Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov said on Tuesday that the statements made to the media by an anonymous Pentagon officials amount to threats against Russian President Vladimir Putin's life. There are some anonymous officials from the Pentagon who have actually enunciated uh, threats 
to deliver a decapitation strike on the Kremlin, which is, in fact, an assassination threat against a Russian president, Lavrov said, according to the Russian news agency TASS. Lavrov appeared to be referring to a recent report from Newsweek that was published in September that cited anonymous U.S. military officials who said the U.S. was considering a decapitation strike to kill Putin in the heart of the Kremlin in response to the Russian leader's warning that he could use nuclear weapons to defend Russia's territorial integrity. It is not clear from the context if the unnamed source meant that the assassination plot was being considered as a potential response to using nuclear weapons, or it could happen before that. Either way, the U.S. military officials discussing such a plan is extremely provocative, even if they are speaking on condition of anonymity. Lavrov's comment come after uh, Senator Lindsey Graham uh, said that the only way for the war in Ukraine to end is if Russia breaks and someone takes Putin out. The Russian diplomat didn't mention Graham's remarks, but said Western powers want to destroy Russia. It is no secret to anyone that the strategic goal of the United States and its NATO allies is to defeat Russia on the battlefield as a mechanism for significantly weakening or even destroying the country, Lavrov said. Now, Lavrov also warned that Russia is going to try to disrupt even more Western arms supplies. Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov warned Wednesday that Russia is working on ways to disrupt Western arms supplies to Ukraine. Seemingly, Russia will start targeting more Ukrainian infrastructure. We observed that Ukraine is receiving more and more and better Western weapons, Lavrov said in an interview with Russian TV, according to Al Jazeera. He said strikes on the railway lines, bridges, and tunnels are being considered. Russia has been pounding Ukraine's energy infrastructure since October, leaving millions of Ukrainians without power and heat for the winter. But Lavrov's comments suggest that Russia will be hitting other types of infrastructure. The Russian diplomat said that those strikes on Ukraine's energy grid have already helped disrupt the supply of weapons, but added that that more will need to be done. I am convinced that there are other plans being applied in this regard. Lavrov and other Russian officials have stressed that the more uh, U.S. and other Western military aid, the, the longer this war will continue to escalate and to drag out. On Thursday, Russia launched another barrage on Ukraine's power grid, striking targets with missiles and drones. Ukrainian Defense Ministry suggested it was one of the largest Russian missile barrages in the war. All right. Let's see. Got a couple more articles here. This one, IDF chief confirms, uh, oh, sorry, this wrong article here. Uh, Belarus shoots down stray Ukrainian air defense missile. Belarus on Thursday said it shot down a stray Ukrainian air defense missile from an S-300 system that ended up in its territory and summoned Ukraine's envoy over the incident. It was primarily established that the fragments belonged to S-300 anti-aircraft guided missile launched from inside the territory of Ukraine, the Belarusian defense ministry said. Now, look, I, I think the good thing is this was handled far better than the last time this happened with an S-300 missile ending up in Poland and killing two people. Uh, we had... For weeks, the Ukrainian government say time and time again that we have to do something about this because this is an attack on our territory um, uh, from from Russia. You know, it's an attack on NATO. You know, NATO has to get involved. Article five, all this. This this was handled much more competently and diplomatically, which which is a good sign. At the, at the same time, you know, the more this happens, the more likely uh, this war war could spiral out of control. Now, one last article here before I wrap up, uh, and this is the little bit of good news I have. Serbia ends state of alert for military as Kosovo stand down. Our standoff eases. Serbia on Thursday lifted the combat readiness after its uh, alert for its troops that enacted on Monday as ethnic Serbs in the northern Kosovo agreed to remove uh, barriers they erected in protest against authorities um, in Serbia. So let's like some good news, but you know, who knows how long this will last and everything. So let's, let's, you know, just keep our fingers crossed here. I'm still trying to learn a little bit more so I could talk about this in a little bit more depth for all of you guys. But, uh, I think with the war in Ukraine, this is something we definitely need to keep our eyes on and be concerned about because this could be like a, a little spillover kind of conflict. All right. That's where I'm going to wrap up the show for today. Uh, I got some traveling and some family stuff going on this week, guys. So I may only have one or two shows out this week, but 
Uh, I anticipate next week being back on normal schedule. Thank you all so much for tuning into the show, for making 2022 such a great year for the show. And uh, do everything you can, you know, just share the show, subscribe to the show, you know, buy your CBD at Paloma Verde, support the Libertarian Institute, support antiwar.com. Uh, do what you can 2023. I really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>